Yep. Thank you, Program Director. Dear colleagues, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the University of South Africa, the College of Economic and Management Sciences community, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this Supply Chain Management Virtual Summit. Thank you all for taking your time off your busy schedule to join us. The theme for our discussion today is Supply Chain Management in Times of COVID-19, Challenges and Lessons Learned. This event is hosted by the College of Economic and Management Sciences, UNISA, in collaboration with the African Institute for Supply Chain Research. I would like to extend a special welcome to our keynote speaker, Honorable Solomon Lechisa Zenodi, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, South Africa. We are delighted to have you in our space, Deputy Speaker, and um, I can attest to you being a great supporter of this event because you were there when we launched it in 2019. And so it is always a pleasure to have you with us to listen to you. You always have a funny way of presenting facts that are very serious, as has been shown in several instances when you were in Parliament. And so we are looking forward to having those funny moments with you today. A special welcome to Professor Manla Makanya, our esteemed Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of South Africa. You are you're most welcome and we appreciate your support, sir. Professor Ambe, through you and the supply chain management team at UNISA, I have had the opportunity to welcome and address supply chain community on several occasions. We thank you for organizing such an event with a team of experts to share their insights today. Mr. Kualile George, I'm told now that uh, he can't make it today, but he's represented by Ms. Letzati. We welcome you to this event. You will share with us our country's COVID-19 supply chain practices, challenges and lessons learned from local government perspective. Dr. Rebecca Citino, a member of ISCA board and a country head for supply chain at Bombardier. Mr. Vule Nemukula, a member of SKI board and group chief, chief procurement officer at Transnet SA. Professor Clava Kayumba, chairman Rwanda Medical Limited. Mr. John Karani, chairman Kenya Institute of Supply Chain Management. Professor Douglas Boateng, chairman Ghana Public Procurement Authority and chief executive officer Pen Avest International Partners. Prof. Benon Basheka, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Affairs, Kabale University, Uganda, who recently presented in one of the series supply chain webinars presented by ASCA. Thank you very much, Professor Basheka, for your contribution in building research capacity in the continent and for your tireless efforts in this regard. We really appreciate it. You are welcome and we look forward to a thought-provoking discussion this morning. As we are all aware, COVID-19 presents an unprecedented and extended emergency impacting the global economy. We also understand that supply chain management is at the forefront of response to COVID-19. However, there have been concerns about the state of COVID-19 emergency spending amid a high level of corruption. As the United Nations Secretary General pronounced in the launch of the report on socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, that, I quote, when we get past this crisis, which we will, we will face choices. Do we go back to the world as it was before or deal decisively with those issues that make us all unnecessarily vulnerable to crisis? Close quotation. Dear colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, 
Supply chain professionals need to assess the impact of COVID-19 in their organization and develop mitigating strategies thereof. The recovery from COVID-19 crisis must lead to a different way in which supply chain is managed to have a sustainable, healthy economy in the continent. The College of Economic and Management Sciences, UNISA, and the African Institute for Supply Chain Research have established an affiliation agreement to foster and advance supply chain management research and capacity development in Africa. ISCA was launched last year on the 30th August under the leadership of one of our own Professor Marcus Amber who also coordinates all MND issues in the Department of Applied Management, specifically for the supply chain and transport and logistics section. The Institute is housed at the College of Economic and Management Sciences, UNISA. We are excited and happy to be part of this noble initiative. We are also happy to house the Research Institute. Supply chain management is one of our key disciplines in the Department of Applied Management within the School of Public and Operations Management, one of the three schools within the college at UNISA. In this department, we do have specialized supply chain management offerings from bachelor's and postgraduate degrees. Our offerings span across the various functional areas of supply chain management. We trust that with the affiliation, we will make a stride to supply chain advancement in the continent. In conclusion, Program Director, I hope that this virtual summit will inspire deliberation around supply chain during COVID-19 lessons learned, will present best practices that may be implemented by authorities to make our continent economically sustainable. I would like to close with a quote from Michael Jordan, and I quote, always turn a negative situation into a positive situation. Close quote. With these few remarks, let me again welcome you all to this virtual summit and thank you for taking time to join us. Thank you and please feel at home. Thank you very much, Prof. Mohali, and the words are much appreciated uh, and we do support everything you say there, specifically when we look around uh, uh, Institute's endeavours with a supply chain in, in the form of research and moving forward. Thank you so much for those words. And without further ado, um, I would like to introduce for the opening address, Professor Makanya, who is the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of UNISA. Now, Professor Makanya was appointed Principal and Vice-Chancellor of uh, the University of South Africa on the 1st of January 2011, and a prominent proponent of higher education, leadership and advocacy. Um, Prof Makanya is past president of the International Council of Distance uh, Education and is also treasurer of the African Council for Distance Education. He is also the president of the Higher Education Teaching and Learning Association, um, the international body. As such, he has a thorough knowledge of higher education trends in both the developing and developed higher education context. Professor Makanya is the Deputy Chairperson of South African National Commission for UNESCO and the Chairperson of the Cultural Sector of South Africa, African National Commission for UNESCO. Professor Makanya, welcome. Thank you for your time. Your 10 minutes starts now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jan Meyer, uh, the Deputy Director of Northwest University Business School, together with uh, your co-director, Ms. Winnie Zamini, who is a lecturer at UNISA. Uh, Prof. Mukhale, Executive Dean of the College of Economic and Management Sciences and other members of Executive and Extended Management. Um, Honorable Ndade Mitisa Tsinori, Deputy Speaker of the South African National Assembly, who is our keynote speaker today. Fellow program participants, Professor Basheka, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs of Kabale University, Uganda, Prof. Douglas Boateng, um, Chairman of Ghana Public Procurement Authority and CEO of Penvest International and Partners, 
Professor Leiva Kayumba, Chairman of Rwanda Medical LTD, Mr. John Karani, Chairman of Kenya Institute of Supply Chain Management, Ms. Humutso Litsati, Chief Officer of Municipal Finance, Fiscal Policy and Economic Growth, representing the CEO of South African Local Government Association, Dr. Kolile George, uh, Mr. Bulen Makule, Group Chief Procurement Officer of Transnet, but also the member of Afghan Institute for Supply Chain Research and board member. Um, Professor Ambe, yourself as president of this AISCR, and Professor Vernon Webb, Acting Director of School of Public and Operations Management, together with our team from the college. Honorable uh, members uh, of the Association of Public Accounts Committee of Office Bearers, Honorable Skosana, um, Honorable Chabalala, Honorable Governor, Honorable Van Steden, and Honorable Mvimbi. Members of the audience, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to join Professor Mukhal in bidding you all a very warm UNISA welcome to this important conference. I'm especially delighted to notice in our distinguished speaking lineup, friends and colleagues from across our continent. Let me just say, it is as it should be. You are all most welcome. I'm confident that we have much to learn from one another in this most unusual and challenging of times. Supply chains have in fact been around since the dawn of time. Think of the famed Silk Road trading route or the Camel caravans that crossed our continent, carrying goods for butter or sail, or the multitude of seafaring vessels that ferried goods across the world. Think of entrepreneurs within countries and continents who manufactured goods such as food and clothing, especially materials for sale for their citizens, and later to neighbors and strangers across the world. All of these, and there are many more examples, by the way, were in fact supply chains in that they involved a connected network of individuals, organizations, resources, activities, and technologies involved in the manufacture and sale of a product or services. And the aim of each and every part of this process was and is profit, irrespective of the political or ideological form of government of the countries involved. I will suggest then that while profit is the motive that drives the supply chain engine, it is also the lure of easy money through corruption that demands ongoing vigilance from supply chain managers. Part of the problem is that although we acknowledge that supply chains have existed, over a long time, we have mostly paid attention to the specific link for which we are responsible. And this has sometimes resulted in ineffective supply chains. And this not only impacts on efficiencies, but it also, and this is more alarming, renders us vulnerable to unscrupulous operators who will and do capitalize on our inefficiencies. We see this, for example, in flawed procurement processes and in deliberate and well-planned hijacking or diversion of goods on their delivery routes, all for easy tax-free profit. Most people will argue that this is nothing new. And even since the days of the Silk Road trade, the camel caravans and seed trading, there have been profiteers and buccaneers just waiting for the opportunity to capitalize on perceived weaknesses in the supply chain process. Many will say that this reality has in fact been accommodated in the supply chain process. For example, many department stores inflate prices to cover the cost of theft and the security measures that have to be implemented to mitigate it. What in the industry is called shrinkage. So yes, 
that reality is understood and mitigated to some degree. But quality, effective supply chain management nevertheless demands consistent governance, proactive improvement, and ongoing vigilance. But what happens when governance measures that all governments have in place to limit corruption and graft and ensure supply chain management are compromised? What happens when we have a global pandemic that compels governments to implement slates of disaster or emergency that comes with the power to circumvent or take shortcuts in procurement processes, close borders to trade, forbid movement and travel of people for any reason within and to and from countries, and severely curtail the sale of specific goods or services, to name but a few of measures that have been imposed globally. Put simply, what happens when the supply chain is disrupted in a very fundamental way and where we do not necessarily have the power or the authority to manage it, as we will do under normal circumstances? In a very real sense, the states of disaster or emergency have opened the floodgates for rampant corruption as we have traveled and as we've seen through the lockdown path. The past few months have been a revelation to us all. We have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Or to be more honest, we have seen the catastrophic. Economies are collapsing or under immediate threat. Businesses are going under. People are retrenched by the millions. Assets are being surrendered, and many have been left homeless and hungry. Fake news abounds, and anarchy hovers ever present on the fringes. In less endowed countries in particular, health systems have revealed what we have all known, that they are largely dysfunctional and our health professionals are not appreciated or supported in the crucial role that they play in ensuring the well-being of our citizens. People are frustrated, depressed, and angry, and many are now plunged into a second wave of misery whose end is unknown. But perhaps worst of all has been the absolute deluge of profiteers corrupt individuals or syndicates who have taken advantage of the gaps offered in, for example, tender and procurement processes to siphon off hundreds of millions, billions, dedicated to relieving already onerous burdens of citizens, or seizing the opportunity to sell banned goods on the so-called black market at massively inflated prices or selling or not delivering at all substandard products such as the PPI. This is as destructive as it is demoralizing, and it has been an extremely painful lesson to learn. We have a long way to go, ladies and gentlemen, in inculcating a level of citizenship that goes beyond the individual to consider the collective. Of course, there have been many positives, such as the revelation of just how caring some of our citizens really are, how dedicated so many of our care professions are, and how resilient we are in dealing with really difficult living circumstances, such as working, teaching and learning, all happening from home. Of course, as a university, we are delighted at the upsurge of interest in the sciences, for example. And we look forward to a resurgence of interest and participation in scientific research and collaborations that will surely accompany that. That said though, what has been proven beyond all doubt on our COVID-19 journey thus far is that effective supply chain management 
is fundamental to national and global sustainability. And so we have to look at ways and means of accommodating these kinds of disruptions in our supply chain models. We have to do so right now, but also with an eye to the future. I trust that this conference or summit will make a signal contribution to that process. And all that remains on my side is to wish all you well, and I'm looking forward to the outcomes of the engagements that are going to be unfolding today. Thank you so much. And we are excited about the opportunities that this conference and summit present. Thank you once again. Prof Mukanya, thank you very much for those inspiring words, words of true wisdom. And it is so important that we keep this collective in terms of the sustainability, that total fundamental issues of the supply chain alive and well, irrespective of the period, the pandemics or any other crisis it may be in. So very wonderful words, so very important. Thank you very much for those words and best of luck with the way forward with you, Nisa. Um, you have serious competition with every other public university at this stage. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> Distance learning. <laughs> but I must admit, in all honesty, you're still the leaders. We we'll still bow to that and acknowledge that. Um, make no mistake, we took a lot from, from um, learning from you. Thank you very much. Thank I you appreciate so much, that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, after that very uh, insightful presentation, we will now move on to an address from the African Institute for Supply Chain Research. Now, I, I don't like calling the acronym by the acronym. I would rather just use it as such. And although the program reflects that Dr. Nteta will be the, the speaker in this case, I was just informed a couple of minutes ago that uh, my co-host in this particular event will be the presenter on this perspective. So uh, she's going to introduce herself quite early in this regard, uh, not only during the lunch break or prior to the lunch break, as she will now present um the institute's perspective this is the role of supply chain in the public domain um, as well as the broader impact that this pandemic had we've got to bear in mind that this summit with its focus on COVID-19 we can actually extrapolate into the pandemic arena as well and the application of lessons learned should be followed through we should not be so absolutely focused on one little thing but looking at how we can make our results and make our solutions applicable in the wider sense and i did have the privilege as well to, to speak on the effect of COVID 19 on the supply chain and it was quite devastating it's quite devastating but for this particular purpose we're going to ask um winnie glamini to step forward uh, and present the perspective of uh, the ASCR to this uh, summit. Uh, Winnie, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. You have 20 minutes starting now. Winnie? Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Mayor. It's be, it is a pleasure for me to be here. And I am hoping that we are all going to love everything that will be said in this uh, summit. Um, uh, greetings to all ladies and gentlemen. A special welcome to Honorable Tsinoli, the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly and the keynote speaker. I also wish to 
welcome um, our Honorable Kosana, our Honorable Shabalala, Honorable Governor, and Honorable Van Staden, and also uh, Honorable Mvimbi. We also acknowledge uh, Prof. Makanya, our uh, principal and vice chancellor in UNISA. And we also uh, acknowledge uh, my dean, Professor Mohale, from the College of Economic and Management Sciences in UNISA. I also wish to extend a warm welcome to uh, our CEO and the chairperson of ISCA, Professor Ambe, uh, Ms. Litate from Salga, uh, Mr. Dave Selby from Department of Health, Mr. Kerani from Kenya Institute of Supply Chain Management, Professor Boateng, uh, Professor Pacheca, as well as Professor Webb and the Acting Director of School of Public and Operation Management in UNISA. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Winnie Lamini. I am here representing ISCA and uh, I hold the position of being the gr uh, grants head in ISCA. I am privileged to share insight from ISCA with you today. ISCA is a leading Pan-African Research Institute that conducts innovative research on supply chain management to, supply, uh, to support continental-wide sustainable development and inclusive growth. At the heart of ISCA is the desire to build supply chain management leadership capability to drive supply chain innovation in the continent, aiming to achieve strategic priorities of the National Development Plan 2030 and Africa Agenda 2063 goals. In particular, ISCA is positioned to play an important role in ensuring business executives and public sector executives who are able to de develop a broader view and constructively employ smart and well-researched supply chain management instruments, both locally and internationally, to enhance quality and margin management. Though uh, through this, ISCA enables the build, uh, building of competitive institutions so that business can responsibly generate the growth that the continent desperately needs. The uh, ISCA formed an affiliation with UNISA, the CAMS College, and it was approved in the college board meeting on the 8th of May 2020. The objective of this agreement was to advance supply chain management research and capacity development in Africa as a whole. The agreement is for uh, an initial period of three years. Um, during this time, CAMS uh, will host the institute and provide uh, offices and equipment to the staff members. So we're truly grateful for this gesture from the University of South Africa. And the areas of collaboration that we have um, uh, achieved thus far include studies and collaborative research on supply chain management, developing research capacity on supply chain management, support the progress and of masters and doctoral students, hosting events such as executive research roundtables, focus group discussions, annual Pan-African conferences, seminars, and a series of roundtable discussions. I think uh, we have already started and we have seen much happening on the platform as ISCA was uh, launched last year in August. Um, the research also includes commissioned and market research projects on supply chain management, a steering committee with members of ISCA and CAMS 
was also established to provide oversight on the strategic collaborations that have been formed thus far. So ISCA has made a meaningful strides since 2019 by forming strategic partnerships and signing various memorandum of agreements with some of the institutions that I can mention. I've already mentioned the University of South Africa, the University of Fort Hare, Northwest University, as well as Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. And during the period of May to September 2020, ISCA has signed a memorandum of, association, of uh, understanding with the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply Chain, that is SIPS, which is the only professional organization for procurement in South Africa. That is a big win for us. And also, as ISCA is in a process of signing memorandum of uh, understanding with Transport Education and Training Authority, that is TITA, and the National University of Science and Technology, um, NAST, and also Zimbabwe, and the University Professional Studies in Accra, Ghana. We hope to contribute much more towards the supply chain sphere and uh, hope you will um, enjoy and learn something from this sub summit. And um, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. That is all from me. Thank you, um, Winnie, uh, Co Program Director, for your sterling. Uh, step in there that you did there and uh, introducing the ASCR to everybody that probably has not heard everything yet. Uh, very important about the wins that we have done up to now, the round tables and so on. I do appreciate that. And I must say also from a personal perspective, very glad to be part and parcel of this bigger picture. Thank you so much, um, Mrs. Lamini. Uh, we uh, now move over to setting the scene for the ASCSR. And uh, none better to do this than the president of the ASCR, which is Professor Marcus Ombe, also from UNISA. Uh, Professor Ombe will set the scene for us with the topic specifically. Um, for the summit, and it will address the state of supply chain practices in times of COVID-19. Now, Professor Ambe is an esteemed professional with over 16 years experience in supply management, and I probably know him for a better part of that 16 years as well. He's a professor at the Department of Applied Management in the School of Public and Operations Management at UNISA, and he's also the founder and president of the African Institute for Supply Chain Research, which we also thank him for, as well as the Deputy Chairperson, Technical Standards and Competencies on the Interim SEM Council for South Africa, the Chairperson of Supply Chain Management Research Group, UNISA, which we form part of, and the Doctoral Coordinator for Supply Chain Management at the Department of Applied Management. Professor Ombe served as the chairperson of the public tender committee at UNISA, as well as the chairperson of the UNISA Enterprise and a Supplier Development Program. Professor Ombe, I don't need to say welcome. You're always welcome. You're always here. You're always busy with everything that we do regarding the ASCR. Please continue. Your 20 minutes starts now. Thank you very much, um, um, Program Director. Um, it's appreciated for this opportunity. Um, but before I'll proceed, I think a lot of acknowledgement have been done, but um, um, it's all well to say all protocol observed, but it then give me the proud privilege to appreciate and thank our Deputy Speaker of Parliament of South Africa, Honorable Solomon Sinoli, um, Honorable Jim, James, um, Sana, our honorable members, 
um, you are present with us, um, our esteemed um, Vice Chancellor, Prof. Makanya, um, Prof. Mogale, uh, Executive Dean for the College of Economics and uh, Management Sciences, our esteemed speakers, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, um, a warm greetings to you all this morning. Um, Africa and the world um, is at war, and the common enemy is the novel COVID-19 pandemic, which has actually changed the nature of business and supply chains in general. Managing the pandemic has generated a unique blow to the world economy, loss of life and simultaneously affecting supply chains, demand and trade. My responsibility here this morning, program director, is to, is to do the setting of the scene to put to context the reason why we are here and hence the title of my presentation, the state of supply chain practices in terms of COVID-19. During this presentation, I would explore the socioeconomic outlook of um, Africa in terms of COVID-19, the potential of supply chain management, COVID-19 global and African situational review, COVID-19 measures that were taken and implemented in Africa. I'll also look at uh, COVID-19 implications to supply chain management. And I'll end with asking key questions in line with what are the practices, challenges, and lessons learned that we took out from COVID-19. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as indicated and probably you would know, that um, Africa is the world's largest and second most populous continent. It is the home to the most, the world's largest free trade area, which is approximately 1.2 billion persons market. Yet the continent is challenged with poverty. We challenge with unemployment, inequality and skills. It is worthwhile to note that three out of every four African are still living under poor human conditions compared to five globally, despite the natural resources within the continent. In South Africa, over 35% of the labor force are unemployed and have given out hope of finding work. According to statistics essay, on an online survey that was conducted during the first quarter of COVID-19 reveals that over 93.2% of the representative are worried about the possible collapse of the South African economy. In actual fact, a later survey that was conducted by Mogajani indicated that the employment rate could actually reach 40% due to the effect of COVID-19. We are seeing instances in North Africa where youth employment rate is moving up to about 25%. It is estimated that COVID-19 will drag the African economies to fall into about 1.4 in line with the GDP, which may even go worse in smaller economies. COVID-19 impacts significantly in terms of export minerals in the continent and resulted in decline in revenue, which we've seen, for example, in Rwanda, which was the biggest impact in terms of minus 5% drop in GDP and looking at Burkina Faso with 2.9%. This in itself tells you the state in which we are and how and its effect in the African economy. And therefore, it is important that we develop mitigating strategies to be able to restore the African economy post COVID-19. And one of such measures that we can be able to foster on 
it is supply chain management. But it is worthwhile to note that, as Prof. Makanya indicated, supply chain management has existed for, for years. It is part of every organization, both in the public and private sectors. And it is one of the key mechanisms that can be able to use to implement policies. Beyond advancing social economic objectives, it could be used in supporting that in line with generating employment, enhancing domestic manufacturing capacity, supporting renewable energy, green and inclusive growth. It also can be used to fast track the recently signed um, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. However, given the potential of supply chain management, one would need to ask a question whether we are leveraging the potential of supply chain management in the continent to drive socioeconomic development and inclusive growth. Given the context of supply chain management, we have seen that it could be used as a catalyst in our economy. It could be used to realize the um, priorities of the African National Development Plan 2030. It could be used to be able to drive Africa Agenda 2063. However, it is often seen as a back office role, especially in procurement in public service. And its contribution is unfortunately seen as minimal or transactional. The South African Supply Chain Management Review, the first of its kind in 2015, acknowledged the fact that the strategic importance of supply chain management in government is not well understood, managed and implemented. In South Africa also, for example, the Auditor General over the years have highlighted weaknesses pertaining to non-compliance and irregular expenditure over the years, which is much driven to supply chain management practices. The lack of appropriate implementation of supply chain practices plays a great role in poor outcomes and leads to irregular expenditure. If we look around us, we also realize that there are limited institutions of higher learning in the continent that are offering supply chain management qualification. If we take, for example, a baseline study that was conducted by the South African National Treasury in 2017, revealed that of the workforce in national departments who are supply chain practitioners, only 44% have adequate qualifications, while 41% of those within the provincial department have the relevant qualifications, and 18% in municipalities have the relevant qualifications. One could ask if this may be a contributing factor, you know, to the supply chain management challenges in the country. While we are battling to build capacity and professionalization in the continent and in the country, and initi initiative such as that of ISCA, um, uh, affiliate partners, the Interim Supply Chain Management Council in South Africa, and all the initiatives in the continent, here comes the COVID-19 pandemic. And one could ask if the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic could actually be the impetus to accelerate efficient supply chain management practices in the continent and professionalization. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to quote from one of our own, Richard Dos Santos, who is a SAPIC's director, who noted in one of the event that this pandemic have highlighted the importance of supply chain to everyone. The conversation around supply chain is happening far more frequently. The conversation is getting to everyone. I expect that more people will begin to have interest in the subject and will be able to leverage that to build a stronger workforce, to build a stronger country. 
Dear participants, as indicated, COVID-19 has had its fair share in terms of disruptions in a global economy and has affected life tremendously, including our supply chains. And as of the 12th of October, the cumulated number of detected COVID-19 cases globally stands over 37.5 million. While in Africa, we are over 1.5 million cases. In the continent, South Africa top ranks in terms of the affected cases, followed by Morocco, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. Following the outbreak of the pandemic in the continent, at least 42 countries imposed partial or full lockdown on the movement and activities of their people. In South Africa, the government responded to the outbreak by redirecting resources to fund a 500 billion package for the health response and relief of social and economic distress. The African Union endorsed a joint continental strategy by member state and regional economic communities by providing a public health platform. The International Monetary Fund approved over 2.7 billion US dollars for COVID-19 emergency related responses in African countries. The European Union donated 500 billion euros to Nigeria to support the country's effort against COVID-19. The AFRI Zimbabwe announces a 3 billion US dollars pandemic trade impact on migration facilities to enhance the capacity of African countries in related to COVID. Ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the measures that were being implemented to be able to alleviate the effect of COVID-19. During the COVID-19 disruptions, one thing has become popularly clear. The way our supply chain was designed made it vulnerable to a pandemic. No one could have predicted the scale, the speed, or gravity of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many governments issued instructions notes on how procurement should be undertaken. For example, in South Africa, the government issued regulations in terms of Section 27.2 of the Disaster Management Act 2002. However, we find that despite the measures put in place and emergency procurement practices that was developed by the National Treasury procurement in terms of COVID poses enormous challenges. And some of these challenges we look at issues of good and services that may not have really been available. They may have been price inflations as demand across the globe far exceeds supply. Contracts may not have been delivered or they have, may have been terminated due to force major situations. Many government contractors may not have been able to continue their businesses at a normal level due to quarantine measures, sicknesses and reduced operations. COVID-19 procurement measures may have also contributed to a risk or potential of corruption following the emergency grants and relief funding programs. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, I will end here by posing some few questions on the basis of the fact that we have extreme supply chain management uh, uh, professionals that will be sharing their insights, their perspective on how COVID-19 supply chain practices were implemented, the challenges and what lessons can we draw such that we can be able to foster effective supply chain management in post-COVID-19. And one of them is that what are the supply chain practices that were employed during this COVID-19? What are the challenges and lessons learned? 
and I've indicated we have some of the best within this platform today to share their insight. But some of the considerations that I want to put from my context, which I love that our esteemed speakers dwell on, looking at the possibility of a fully embraced digitalization, digitalized supply chain processes, we are in the era of fourth industrial revolution. Professionalization of supply chain management to be able to develop standard ethics license to practice. We all feel said that we need a license to practice and to be able to establish supply chain management as a discipline, such as in nursing, such as in um, the legal profession, such as in engineers. To be able to build adequate capacity and development, increase spending on supply chain research and development to be able to shape and inform policy decision making. To implement e-procurement systems and use of open data, open contracting principles, enforce disclosure transparency, foster localization, industrialization to promote local suppliers and create jobs, less dependent on China for the supply of commodity. I think we've all learned and seen what have happened to the continent following over reliant on the West and China. Promote inter-trade in the continent, restructure our supply chain, and to be able to enforce accountability, transparency, monitoring and evaluation of supply chain management performance. Ladies and gentlemen, that is food for thought. And we trust that our speakers will be able to share light on that. I wish to thank you all for making the time to join us for this um, uh, summit. And I encourage you to still keep safe and observe COVID-19 preventive measures. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Marcus. Marcus. Uh, uh got a feedback at this stage. Uh, okay, there, that's gone now. Uh, very inspiring words, very true words. Um, the monitoring evaluation, so important at the end. I think much was lost, much has to be learned, and something that we really have to take forward. A lesson that things don't just happen, measurable items to be in place. Thank you so much for this setting the scene and the dynamic of specifically uh, this summit with this focus that lies so near and dear to each and every one of us. We appreciate your efforts in this and your message in this. And I'm sure that all the speakers in this case will contribute to your request towards the end. Ladies and gentlemen, let us, we're slightly behind our schedule tight per the program, if you had noticed. So without much ado, the keynote address this morning uh, will be done by the Honorable Tanoli, who is the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly. And we welcome uh, Honorable Tanoli to the virtual podium in this case, uh, where he will indulge us with the enabler of the social economic development um, and the lessons learned from COVID-19. Uh, from COVID now, Mr. Tsunoli is and was the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly in the fifth and sixth Parliament of the Republic of South Africa. He has more than 25 years as a public representative, including roles in both legislative sectors and the executive. A member of parliament since 94, Mr. Tsunoli served in the portfolio committees of, amongst others, numerous constitutional development, local government, housing, the Adult Committee in represented political parties, special ministerial committees on the transformation of the Independent Development Trust, the IDT, and numerous others. Mr. Tsunoli, if you please welcome, you have 40 minutes to entertain this assembly 
with your wisdom. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mayor. I really feel uh, glad to join you today with Professor um, Amba and Dr. Mkhali, Professor Mkhali, and uh, Professor Makanya. Uh, I'm really excited to be able once more to join you uh, today. We appreciate you inviting us to this critical platform and we appreciate this opportunity to deepen our relations. Um, I'm aware you have invited, as you said earlier, my colleagues from the legislatures, from the newly set up Association of Public Accounts Committees, APEC, uh, which has just been set up uh, for the sixth term recently. And I wish to congratulate uh, that is Kosana uh, for his election as the chair. Uh, we haven't met personally, including on visual as well, so I'm seeing him for the first time today after his election in that capacity. Um, uh, the invitees comes from the public accounts committees of each of our legislatures. It is not because all the other legislatures are not important, uh, in fact, they are critical. The appropriations and finance and all the others, trade and industry and so on, those portfolio and select committee, uh, we cannot overstate our oversight responsibility uh, to change our country for the better <clears throat> in this area that we are talking about. Technology, uh, its accessibility and uh, uh, of its infrastructure, uh, the capacity and knowledge to use it is a two-edged weapon. So, Prof. Amber, your question about digitization, uh, this is where it hits the snack. That uh, our programs, for example, to expand uh, what we call uh, Connect SA, have been slowed down dramatically. The result is that even on platforms such as this, that we hold those of our colleagues who are in rural areas are not able to do so effectively. Students who would like to continue their studies, you would know this better than me, have difficulty communicating and having access to a stable uh, infrastructure and um, cost effective if not extremely cheap uh, data are prohibitions uh, to effective engagement on the system. So talking about technology, we need a way to level the playing field for people in our countries. Um, it can serve as a platform for local and international exchange. It can also, however, lead to domination by the more established to the disadvantage and overshadowing of local indigenous products and services. This is a, a, a critical aspect of our approach to this matter. These changes are critical uh, in the capacity of the state to carry out its mandate, for example. Today, I will urge you that uh, let us stay our course uh, by the way, and not forget our vision uh, to build an unracial, non-sexist and democratic society in form and content. Further, that our orientation must be at least egalitarian to reinforce the dignity and respect of every South African. That practicing Bhutu, Ubuntu or humaneness is critical part of achieving these constitutional values. Some people have said, how could anybody, even if they are thieves, choose uh, their horrible practice in an environment of a pandemic? <laughs> Where is their heart? Uh, Where is their humaneness, <laughs> if they have any?
And so, in other words, uh, we are saying that we should not be distracted uh, by the sheer horror and embarrassment of what is emerging publicly these days via the number of commissions uh, and principally the Zondo Commission, which are exposing some of the issues we are discussing and talking about today that went wrong and horribly wrong in certain instances. Our talk today is a humble contribution uh, to the objectives uh, to encourage an approach to our work that is rooted in the dignity of people, in the dignity of the relationship we should have in our interaction uh, to live together, uh, both here at home and elsewhere. Let me begin uh, with a fairly accurate emerging observation that uh, I think this has partly been said as well, that COVID-19 simply deepened a multi-layered, um, rather multi-layered crises that were already with us. The crisis of poverty, unemployment and inequality, of poor economic performance, we were almost in a recession, uh, uh, especially given the, the downgrading and, and so on, of the levels of corruption in both public and private spheres. Um, and of course, the impact of the pandemic itself and the lockdown on the economic uh, character. So the interaction of these uh, crises became a huge problem. I'm going to suggest, by the way, also that uh, uh, Crisis, in addition to prevent to providing us with an opportunity to rethink and redirect and course correct, as I suggest, but they also unfortunately are platforms for others to take advantage of the situation uh, to their personal private interests. And the PPE uh, scandal is perhaps a classic example of that. We are suggesting that if anything, nothing should be done to further deepen these problems. Instead, we should act decisively to protect the most vulnerable, the destitute, especially because they are the ones who suffer the, the most from a variety of angles when things go wrong and place our country on a visibly progressive turnaround. Today's initiative of the African Institute for Supply Chain Research and uh, President Ramaphosa's announcements on Thursday in the joint sitting of parliament he has requested, we hope will contribute to the trajectory of a progressive turnaround of our country. The COVID-19 uh, personal protection equipment, as I said, scandal is very embarrassing, but it also offers us on reflection an opportunity to learn from our mistakes. As Professor Makanya said, the bad and the good. Many of the problems laid bare by the impact of the pandemic have roots in our socioeconomic system that renders so many vulnerable to disasters. And this is not only in our country, but in the continent and in the world, in the United States of America. The most negatively affected uh, people by the pandemic uh, happen to be black, and poor uh, with compromised uh, health systems uh, that simply added to the problems they were already having. One of the 
critical aspects of this is that um, is the erosion of the state capacity and of course the slow progress of building it uh, partly to blame those who got tenders without prior determination of their capacity evidently were not qualified so they promptly outsourced to existing uh, white controlled firms even when it was it went to affirmed companies it has tended to lead to price escalation we know now that it breeds corruption fronting as well and so the rush as we saw during the COVID-19 following the announcement of the resources available was partly for others to try and make a quick buck. Monopoly in sectors such as this one uh, leads uh, to barriers of entry and in the in the untransformed business environment that we said precedes COVID-19. It is important, uh, for example, uh, to note that uh, as far back as uh, 2010, the collusion that was exposed uh, amongst big firms uh, is an example of this problem. And given the levels of poverty, inequality and unemployment, this effective exclusion of the poor and others uh, uh, makes it very difficult for entry and uh, dealing with these problems and thus becoming dangerous if they continue. The correct path out of this morass is to recognize the value of industrialization, focusing on localizations skill development, cooperative community initiative, and small business. Soon after 2009, by the way, a, a Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission was created. In order to assess the required infrastructure needs and how those infrastructure developments must be informed by looking at the necessity for localization, for building skills uh, on an ongoing basis, especially relating also to maintenance, but also green economic initiatives, so that there is ecological consideration in what we're doing today, and we don't place uh, an increased vulnerability over time. So this is why uh, this idea is so important and it is so bad when uh, the Prasa, for example, locomotive debacle illustrates what's wrong with undermining localization initiatives. We have capacity in the country on which we could have built those locomotives. Imports usually become the convenient solution to people without capacity, who, as we say, promptly outsource and tenders, outsource the tenders they received corruptly. And so what we have is not industrialization, but continuing dependence of on finished goods coming from elsewhere. The breakdown of internal capacity, uh, for example, also at Prasa and at South African Airways, opens up space for private external players to do that function. Here too, it increases the cost to the state and the public. The South African Airways internal capacity has been legendary and provided support to many airlines throughout the world and unfortunately 
because of this desire to hollow the state out and erode its capacity, uh, we see initiatives just like in Prasa that are rendering that capacity that has been built over time and thus creating vulnerability. Now we must depend on others from outside at a higher fee. The premium is huge and so and this is where part of the problem lies. But even more brazen is often the officials, the public servants resigning and then returning to offer the same service, but now as consultants at a higher fee from across the public sector. And so the hollowing of the of state capacity continues and creates this problem. There's no doubt that the executive oversight role of uh, CFOs and their finance teams to ensure proper management of supply chains cannot be overemphasized. This is so especially value for money. Goods and services procured is scarcely played. In other words, this this uh, we would we expect that people given the responsibility for uh, uh, using public resources and overseeing them to ensure that we have value for money in how that money is used so that we can use it to advance the broader objectives of a read of a developing country that we are, its reconstruction and development and building capacity across the board. And the role of those in charge of finances, broadly speaking, is critical in this regard. The outgoing Auditor General would agree with me that a robust oversight over supply chain management is, a sure, is sure to prevent fraud and corruption. Lapses in this area simply creates opportunities for thieves to thrive. A Zambian doctor uh, around uh, 2002, um, in a training we were undertaking, says to us that he heard from a minister in Zambia who said that uh, it is very easy to fill potholes on the road. The problem uh, is filling those potholes that are in our heads, he said, pointing at his own head, or our hearts. The potholes there are very difficult to fill. And, and it is here uh, in which we are suggesting that without work to insist, not just the finance teams led by the CFO in these organizations, but the entirety of the management and administration and in the public sector, its political uh, leadership should be sensitive to this matter of focusing on public expenditure to ensure that the procuring of goods and services is done appropriately. It is completely ridiculous that you insist on renting glasses, a crate full of glasses at 20 rand each, and so which you could have bought for five rand each and maintain them properly inside. But this is the kind of things that gets done on a regular basis. We do have, however, interesting examples of how things can be done differently. Some of the CFOs and other finance teams um, have done well under huge pressure to act otherwise. Uh, the public service is the space in which our potential rests with people 
who are sensitive to such approach to work, who recognize the resources that we have uh, available for reconstruction and development. Uh, many of them, some of them, let's say so, have already appeared in some of the commission to give account of what they did uh, to prevent wrongdoing and how they then subsequently got, got dealt with harshly. We need each of us, whether political or administrative or in the private sector, running businesses, to recognize the value of acting appropriately all the time over these areas that we are talking about. We are aware too, uh, in addition to things being done well, of people who responded to the pandemic creatively using their own strengths. For example, the, the motor uh, companies uh, in the in this uh, industry came together to use their productive capacity to produce ventilators, for example, some of which we received externally by donation from others. But essentially, this is what the motor, motor companies recognize that the productive capacity they have could be deployed to produce these ventilators, which appears as a need during this, this uh, pandemic uh, disaster. We also uh, uh, would like to commend uh, uh, the generosity and collaboration, both public and private sectors, that was displayed during this period. We have in mind here the Solidarity Fund and food and health support for the elderly and the poor, including the unemployed. The relief funds and in, uh, an, an increase in grants, child support grants, for example, were inspired. They must continue. Otherwise, we have a disaster in the making. If the statistics, as Professor Amber was referring to, by states say are anything to go by, uh, we have to insist this must go down, must go on. The lockdown uh, in many countries worldwide demonstrated the necessity for resourcefulness when pandemics hit us. How do we build our immunity to recover quickly when the popo hits the fed? Uh, one of the uh, problems, the Disaster Management Act, uh, that we adopted is one of the most progressive pieces of legislation that speaks about doing things in advance to prepare for the eventuality of disasters. And when they do take place, how to respond thereon. And in the recovery process from disasters, to strengthen this, uh, what I call immunity so that at least we strengthen our ability that when the next ones come, we are able to respond uh, uh, and react better and recover quickly, uh, just as when your immune system is strong, even if you get a slight hit by disease, you recover quickly faster than someone whose immune system is weak. Similarly, this is the sort of things we would like to see in our institutions across the board. Further drought and, and floods, we are told the El Nino phenomena has gone past. We are now uh, entering a, a, a phenomena that is characterized by wet weather and the floods are going to be uh, part of the field day. Rising sea levels are likely to give us even more headaches if we do not learn from our mistakes, from our slow transformation, for example, in the water sector, for example, where uh, while some of the farmers have agreed to let go of land in a number of areas, they have chosen to retain, which was a crazy system, the water licenses, uh, which means that those who now have land now depend on the license holders who are previously advantaged people 
who continue to dominate uh, the, the, the environment with those licenses. Research aimed at better understanding the nature of the risks we face, if we are not properly prepared, cannot be overemphasized. We must ruthlessly expose deliberate obstacles placed before communities to service themselves. So the application, the practice of supply chain management by a variety of players. We do emphasize the state and its responsibility for oversight because it does so and handles public finance over which we are saying uh, these must be watched closely uh, to ensure that uh, what we do, we strengthen the capacity of the state, but we also interact in our interaction with business in the relationship we ought to have. Uh, that relationship is not at the disadvantage of uh, the state and the people it represents. The history and practice, or let me, let me just say this, that in the white paper on local government, there is reference to what should be public public partnership and public community partnership amongst others, which have not really been sufficiently uh, put together. The interinstitutional, intermunicipal, interprovincial, for example, collaboration, so that we maximize the impact that we collectively have. To be able to uh, handle those uh, products and services that are required for servicing the communities in an efficient and effective manner. And this is the failure of uh, implementing decisions that, that were taken in the past. That public public uh, 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 collaboration is critical, so is public and community collaboration critical to capacities for doing the, that kind of collaboration of inter-institutional, inter-state uh, is lacking and is not sufficiently strong and needs to be built. Let me conclude by saying that we support fully the Zondo Commission. It says to us our relationship with the people here at home and abroad depend for its success on acting always ethically and with integrity. There is no question that in the continuation of the African Institute for Supply Chain Research, uh, when you assess the work of the Zondo Commission, you will find gems of what to do and what not to do. It is not only the question of having people, for example, being prosecuted. It is also about uh, development practices that that reflect appreciation of handling the supply chains in a developmental manner and uh, in a manner that enriches uh, all participants and is not costly to the state nor to citizens of the country. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Prof. Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity. Honourable Tsunodi, most impressive. Once again, thank you so much for an excellent address, um, alluding to so much that we can take forward, that we can also assist with as supply chain um, practitioners, executives at various fronts. We do appreciate your time and the message that you have shared with us. So very important in this day and time uh, not only because of COVID, but because of everything that goes on around COVID. The world does not stand still because of COVID. Yes, it is there, but there's so much that we still have to do. And you've alluded to so much. Thank you very much for this very, very good presentation and the time that you had taken to address the ASCR on this matter. We appreciate your presence and best of luck with all your endeavors forward and your very important task that lies ahead. Thank you once again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there might be a small change in the offering for the program. Um, our timing is slightly 
uh, behind schedule and we'll have to make some adaptions as we go along. So bear with us being a virtual one and being the supply chain managers, we can easily adapt. Um, I now want to take the opportunity to uh, to introduce our first speaker of the event really. Now it sounds funny. It's the first speaker. It's a real addressing the topic area specifically the Honorable Scorsana, um, the APEC chairperson and the chair of the PAC for the Pumalanga legislature. Honorable Scorsana, um, as the first competitive speaker this morning, will address us on the topic of supply chain practices under pandemic conditions. And his title is COVID-19 Supply Chain Practices, Challenges, Lessons Learned, Association of Public Accounts Committee, APEC Perspective. Honorable Scorsasana, thank you, welcome. Your time starts now. Thank you very much, Professor Mayor and Ms. Winnie as a core program director. Professor Mokhali, Executive Dean College of Economics and Management Science at UNISA. Professor Manja Makanya, the Principal and Vice Chancellor of the Un University of South Africa. Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of the Republic of South Africa, Honorable Zinoli Dichisa. Professor Ambi, Professor Supply Chain Management at UNISA, and my colleagues at the APEC, distinguished guests, honorable members, I greet you all. Professor, it gives me an immeasurable honor and great delight to come and make inputs on the topic titled COVID-19 Supply Chain Practices, Challenges and Lessons Learned to this very significant supply chain management summit as we reflect and ponder on numerous and critical supply chain management vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 social economic development, emergency procurement policies, procurement of goods, works and services to prevent or minimize the spread of the virus and save, and save lives and livelihood. This summit takes place for the seven days after the Association of Public Honorable uh, Council, could you just switch on your video, please? Okay. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. This summit takes place for the seven days after the Association of Public Accounts Committees has held its visual conference on the 31st August 2020. It hopes to share with you some of the resolutions that we have taken as the APEC. Program Director, it is necessary to convey our profound appreciation to the organizers of this summit. To us as elected public representatives who are charged with constitutional mandate to conduct oversights on the executive in the three spheres of government, that is national departments, provincial departments, and local government as well, as all the state-owned enterprises or parastatals. This summit... Scorsesano, apologies, your video is still off. Um, if you could just perhaps switch it on. Oh, it was on and I switch it off after your instruction. Thank you oh, very much. Have, thank you very much. Thanks, Honorable Scorsese. <laughs> yes. 
This summit occurs also at the time when we have already received the real-time audit report on 16 of the key COVID-19 initiatives introduced by, by government and the management of 147.4 billion of the funds made available for these activities. We in APEC acknowledge that the AG's audit work in terms of the aforesaid report is for all expenditure up to and including 31st July 2020. We're expecting to receive another detailed audit report which might be received by end of November 2020. I have deliberately program director mentioned this AGS report owing to the fact that to us they are an important and indispensable tool for our oversight to work when we hold executive accountable for their exercises of the cons constitutional functions and the execution of their constitutional powers insofar as the resources that were approved by parliament and nine legislatures. The AG was and still correct when he submitted that emergency responses and quick actions are required to save life, lives and livelihoods. But the easing of controls and the streamlining of processes and procedures to respond to the crisis expose the government to risk of the misuse or abuse of public resources. This is the critical challenge that we have learned as APEC. The summit should spread, should, sorry, the summit should appreciate that the AG has been reporting on and warning about poor financial management controls, a disregard for supply chain management legislations, and inability to effective management projects, and a lack of accountability in management of the government sectors that now need to lead or support the government's efforts. Program director, without fear or contradictions, we confirm that the AG could state that there has been a compromised environment that is characterized by the pre-existing deficiencies in the supply chain processes of government were exacerbated by the introduction of the emergency procurement processes permitted for personal protective equipment. As APEC, we take stand exceptions as I will briefly outline our resolutions, the fact that there have been signs of overpricing and fair processes, potential fraud and supply chain management legislation being breached. Our APEC visually program director, visual conference was premised on the theme enhancing public financial accountability through strengthening leadership integrity and partnerships Honorable Scorsisono. It appears we lost the Honorable Scorsisono. Production team, could you just check for us, please? Okay. Whilst we wait for the Honorable Scorsisano to revisit us and share his expertise, um,
we will get uh, the production team to check on him and find out if he's experiencing technical problems at this stage. Uh, he was not the person that indicated electricity failure as far as I know. Um, this just might be another technological hitch that he might be experiencing. Um, if I could have an indication whether we should uh, continue um, because I'm a bit concerned about our time. I uh, haven't had clarity on the point of uh, the licensing in terms of four versus 16 hours uh, per shot, whether we'll get to the 11.50 mark. Oh, I'm hearing something. From the program director, I'm back. Okay, yes, thank you, Honorable Scorsesana. We were worried. Yes, <laughs> concerned, <you. laughs> concerned that, that something in the supply chain went wrong there. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you. you. Program director again. From this main theme, four sub themes were derived, namely preemptive and preventative oversight and forecast intervention mechanisms to enhance leadership integrity and public accountability. Secondly, consideration on partnerships for effective public financial accountability and development. Thirdly, strengthened and cooperative governance for effective leadership integrity in public financial accountability. And lastly, control, co coordinated consequences management, actions and measures for effective leadership integrity in public accountability. After the plenary deliberations program director, during the APEC visual conference, all resolutions under these sub-themes were adopted and the APEC will convene its first general assembly where in a committees or scopus from the nine jurisdictions, including national parliament. In, in sharing briefly with the summit, just some of the considerations of the APEC conferences, we noted that effective oversight on public financial accountability requires that both ex post facto and ex ante mechanisms be implemented. By ex ante, we mean looking at the future based on possible predictions, where ex post factor, we mean that we look at the results and events that they have occurred. In year oversight by public accounts committees provides for forecast intervention mechanisms to be considered. This in-year oversight includes preventative oversight, which is a proactive approach that is aimed at identifying risk and requires assurance from, from account, account, accounting officers and accounting authorities that these risks are being mitigated. Preemptive oversight which is intended to examine and propose interventions to mitigate against possible financial mismanagement and gaps in, finance, in financial controls. Amongst other resolutions in this regard, APEC resolves that ex post, ex -post factor oversight role, responsibilities of public accounts committees must be strengthened as a tool mechanism to follow up on financial management problems resulting from the audited report of the AG. We have also resolved that we must strengthen our preventative oversight. Public accounts committees should at the beginning of each financial year receive and consider the plans from accounting officers and accounting authorities, which are aimed at enhancing effective financial management and to deal with risk areas for the year. Furthermore, we have also resolved that we must 
strengthen preemptive oversight, public accounts committees may consider annual purchase for public institutions with the intention to identify priority budgeted programs, projects which may have the potential controls to be undermined or overloaded as attested by the AG in this audit report of COVID-19. Program director at the APEC conference noted that the Public Finance Management Act, the Financial Management of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act and Treasury regulations call for measures to be taken to implement effective, efficient and transparent process of financial and risk management for reporting and disclosure of any irregularity may occur. It is known that PFMA and Flambla and Treasury regulations requires the following. Effective and appropriate disciplinary steps to be taken for contravention or failure to comply with the, the provisions of these pieces of legislation and the regulations. For committing acts that undermine the financial management and internal control systems and outline consequences management actions and measures to be taken in cases of financial management and wrongdoings. Admittedly, there has not been adequate and deliberate implementation of consequence management actions and measures resulting in lacks in financial management and financial financial systems. Hence, the AG refers to a compromised control environment. Thus, today, the country is seized with the task of dealing decisively with the COVID-19 PPE's corruption. As APEC, we believe that consequence management measures and actions to be implemented in instances of gaps in financial management and systems should be corrective and aimed at building capacity and development and in instance of wrongdoing and transgression, the measures should be punitive and aimed at recovery of loss and damage as per the relevant legislation. In light of the foregoing APEC resolve that Public accounts should receive regular findings, re regular briefings from the department and entities, audit committees on matters regarding corporate governance in order to obtain relevant information not available through the publications produced during the budget cycle. We further resolve that public accounts committees should request regular briefings with the relevant chapter 9 and 10 institutions, public protector, AG, and public service commission, etc. Program director, in conclusion, all the, all the public accounts committees in the respect provincial legislatures and national parliament will be receiving full briefing on the AG's report and thereafter invite all the departments to account on how the department have spent the COVID-19 related and prioritization budget in ensuring that they stop the spread of virus and save lives and as well as livelihood. Thank you very much for an opportunity, uh, Professor Mayor. Thank you. Honorable Krosana, we appreciate the time and this very important message that you had delivered uh, for us uh, from the public accounts uh, committees. It is so important that we do know um, that there is so much support, so much effort and emphasis placed on uh, this environment. And thank you for taking the time and sharing this very valuable information with the summit and in particular with the association. Um, 
because it is important also for anybody that wishes to do research and wishes to further assist in this matter. So once again, thank you for your time. We appreciate your time. Uh, we know it's very valuable and best of luck with your task ahead. Very important task and yes, may you enjoy it. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, if we move on now, uh, Mr. George would have addressed us at this stage uh, as the CEO of Solga, um, but in his stead, we having Mrs. Khomatsu uh, Letsetsi, who is the Chief Officer, Officer, Municipal Finance and Fiscal Policy of Solga. And um, she will address us on the matter uh, of the supply chain practices, but from a local government perspective. So this gives us a more holistic. We've just had it from um, the perspective of um, the Public Accounts Committee, and now we're having this from the local government perspective. It gives us a very holistic feel for the supply chain management in the entirety for research purposes and specifically for the summit, it fits in and everything. Mrs. Uh, Letsatsi is the founding partner of MatMap Corporation, PDY Limited, and prior to uh, finding MatMap, uh, Khomatsi served in the public sector for over 19 years in numerous organizations, including the City of Johannesburg, National Treasury, and Public Investment Corporation. Uh, she served in the city of Johannesburg for 10 years, held several positions, including the group treasurer role, um, and she'd been in the forefront of developing and executing financial turnaround strategies in the city of Johannesburg that resulted in the credit rating upgrade of by both Moody's and Fitch. So we're really looking forward to a presentation on this government, uh, the local government's perspective on the COVID-19 challenges. Um, Mrs. Lesatsi, your time starts now. You have 20 minutes. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mayer, and greetings. Greetings to your esteemed panelists and as well as the participants. Um, I hope, I know my network, my bandwidth is very low, I hope I'm very audible and I would manage to basically go through the presentation without much uh, disturbance. Um, so in terms of just covering the landscape around supply chain, we thought it's basically befitting to just reflect in terms of what has transpired um, around the impact that COVID-19 would have had on the operational landscape um, for, for government as well as the private sector. And, and basically what has happened is that definitely uh, COVID-19 has had, had an adverse impact on the economic activity and operational environment, especially for local government. We've seen revenue losses up to 60%, um, especially for lower tier municipalities, but safe to say that with the metros, given how diversified they are from a revenue base, uh, metros would have seen a revenue loss of around 30% between the period of March um, when the disaster was basically announced um, up until around June, which is the end of the, the financial year. So definitely a double whimming on that particular uh, perspective, um, given that uh, with the responses in containing the, the pandemic, um, municipalities were required to basically be very agile in terms of their procurement processes as well as their payment processes to various service providers. And that would have been challenging under the, 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 the operating environment. Um, and as well as you would have seen that, um, as it was actually indicated earlier on, around the revision and the impact in terms of the GDP and how that would actually affect um, and government and its, its ability to basically respond um, basically to the pandemic in terms of the fiscal constraints that come with it. But what is actually very important to basically note is the issues around the leadership issues and governance issues that are coming through in local government. If we look at the 1819 AG report and the AG basically titled that report that uh, there's little to go about, yet the right hands are not at the till. And that's on its own is basically very telling 
Uh, and one of the things that is basically highlighted there is how long um, municipalities and local government actually take to pay, take take to basically pay the creditors and consequently meaning that the supply chain processes get impacted in that particular in that particular regard but one thing that actually became very apparent is that covid-19 definitely exposed um, the inefficiencies in our processes and systems and the resilience of our processes and systems in terms of responding um, in a disaster kind of a, kind of a setup. Uh, our systems are very manual basically in nature. They take very long, the red tape. So we're definitely never ready in terms of being agile around responding to the demand on the procurement systems in terms of, of local government. So from that end, there's definitely room for improvement. And I think the other issue that was basically exposed in the process is the issues around the powers and functions um, for all three spheres of government. And given that local government is a service delivery facing sphere of government and pretty much the front office of government. So if communities have got challenges the first offices that they knock at is basically local government. And we would have seen as well that with the directives that was basically issued by the Minister of Kota, Dr. Nkwasasa Nazuma, there was there were issues around the interpretations of those directives and in terms of who should be doing what in terms of containing basically the pandemic. So definitely from that end around powers and function, there's definitely a need to basically look at those and basically see how resilient those would be in an event that we are faced with a disaster of this magnitude, basically as government. So if I have to move, um, although the response in SA to outbreak the COVID-19 pandemic has been swift and decisive, there is definitely flaws in the local government fiscal framework. So what we've basically seen from a local government is that a whole lot of those directives were issued, but not necessarily accompanied by the fiscal instruments to basically assist municipalities in responding to those, and especially rural municipalities. So what we've seen is that the metros, which have got much bigger balance sheet and much diversified revenue sources and options to basically manage their cash flows, uh, were able to respond much quicker and even to the extent of bridging some of the expenses, whereas the lower tier municipalities who would not necessarily have access to cash flow financing instruments um, as the, the counterparts or the metros actually found it very challenging in terms of responding without the actual budget allocation. Um, and I think the other main thing that actually became very apparent around the agility aspect of it is the, the whole administration around the disaster relief um, wherein um, the manual process that's basically involved under normal circumstances, you'd find that municipalities that are able to basically put together response plans as quick as possible that have got capacity to do so, they were very agile in that process. Whereas uh, for the lower tier municipalities where capacity then becomes an issue, even the quality of the submission made it actually very difficult to actually respond as quick as possible in, in terms of basically uh, containing the pandemic. So that those processes around managing the disaster, allocating the financial resources to local government as quick as possible, definitely there is room for improvement in that particular regard. But also what also came out around that process is how insufficiently we've allocated over the years the budget resources around dealing with the disaster. Of course, nobody could have preempted a disaster basically of this magnitude. So the resources that have been allocated over time were actually extremely insufficient. And to give an example, the overall uh, disaster relief grant for the sector was around 356 million, um, whereas the requirements were basically running in billions. So definitely room for improvement in that particular regard in order to, to enable us to actually respond to, to a pandemic and a crisis basically of, of this magnitude. And the equitable allocation as well um, was an issue that actually became apparent that in this current environment where there's limited resources, uh, how do you then make sure that resources are allocated to those municipalities that are basically in their needs from a resource point of view? And again, also balancing that 
against the bigger metros, which actually are more densified and the populations are actually much bigger. Um, so definitely um, a need to actually review those allocation criteria um, as well. Um, so if I have to move um, to the next slide, in terms of um, the feedback uh, that we got uh, from, from the members and how they experienced uh, the whole supply chain chain processes uh, during COVID. So what we're finding in, in terms of the responses is that the municipalities felt that the processes were very manual in nature and especially around the su submission of documentation. And it was very difficult to manage the process and especially within um, uh, the level five, basically lockdown with very strict restrictions. Um, and also the need uh, to basically certify documents. It has never really envisaged uh, a crisis of this nature whereby supply chain practitioners will then have to, to basically operate remotely. Um, the emergency procurement circulars that National Treasury issued did assist to a certain extent um, in terms of relaxing um, some of those, some of the processes around emergency procurement. But however, with what we basically see in the media, um, clearly that, I mean, the human factor basically always comes in that as much as we've got very um, strong institutions and legislation and policies, the enforcement of it then becomes an issue, issues around internal controls as it has basically been mentioned. So human behavior clearly is the biggest challenge that we have as a country and the enforcement of it thereof. And as a result in this particular instance around and also in dealing with the challenges that are coming through as a result of how we responded to COVID-19, that is definitely important that there's partnership across all spheres of government as well as law enforcing agencies in terms of extracting accountability and basically using the existing levers that are provided for in the legislation. There's definitely a gap there in terms of containing the level of corruption and craft that we basically see in the sector. And I think some of the earlier presenters actually touched on the issues around connectivity, um, that as much as we talk about e-platforms, the reality of the matter is that with the structural challenges that we have as a country, even from an infrastructure point of view, um, it might not be a one size fit all um, kind of an approach, but definitely we need, there's a need to look at various options in terms of how do we then introduce that agility in our processes without basically compromising um, uh, the governance aspect that have already been raised um, over the years by the AG. And definitely with what is basically going in the media, it will seem that there's actually more that we'll basically be dealing with in terms of how the whole procurement around COVID related basically has been handled. So the standard operating procedures on protocols needs to be set in advance uh, for the whole government, uh, simulated or st stress tested to ensure it will stand up to the pressures when the time basically comes. So there's definitely lessons learned from this particular phase um, so that then we've got very tight processes and systems uh, that would em embrace uh, the principles around public finance uh, management and municipal finance management. Uh, the move to e-procurement, uh, and especially this would probably go hand in hand with the fifth utility that is no longer a luxury um, to have con connectivity irrespective of where you are, uh, basically in South Africa. So definitely a move towards that and making sure that that, that service is basically provided for. Uh, and that also basically just goes to uh, not necessarily in local government, but we've also seen in schools in the education sector how children in rural areas were basically disadvantaged because of these issues that we basically have of poverty and inequality as, as a country and the fact that uh, most municipalities in rural areas would definitely have challenges basically around connectivity. So as we think through some of the solutions, it's basically also keeping in mind where we are as a country and how we have inclusive processes and solutions. Um, the issue around the DDM approach as well, 
um, would actually assist basically a great deal in terms of pulling the various capacities and systems and basically and, and processes in that regard. Um, further enhancement to the fun uh, functioning of the office of the chief procurement officer should also be, be, be considered. Um, there's definitely a need to standardize um, on procurement of items um, so that then we address the issue where you find one municipality procuring a bottle of water or masks, um, whatever the case might be, the PPE at one price, and then the other municipality basically procuring it at another price. So the standardization in terms of those kind of items and transversal contracts uh, becomes very necessary. Um, there's also an, um, an issue around the disaster relief and the equitable allocation in a very agile manner and basically relooking really on how we prepare uh, for, for disaster as a country and the fiscal um, instruments that we basically set aside definitely a, a need to review that particular process. It was not agile enough. Um, I mean, it took um, COPTA as well as National Treasury in terms of allocation of those funds over 90 days um, since the first, since lockdown was basically announced. Uh, so that definitely compromised the ability of local government to basically respond of uh, containing the pandemic. Um, so that's all from me, uh, Program Director. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much, Mrs. Uh, let's start see. We really appreciate your time um, and the information that you had shared with us. If I could just ask you perhaps to mute your microphone. I'm getting feedback. That's it. Um, Thank you so much. Um, thoroughly enjoyable presentation. In, it's always nice to hear how much is being done, how much is being considered, and that everything is really on a road for correction and adaptation. And it really makes sense, and we appreciate that we are part in this forum to hear and to learn of these uh, changes and these amendments taking place. Again, thank you very much for your time. We thoroughly appreciate it. And best of luck with everything and all the endeavors ahead. Uh, very important endeavors. And um, yes, keep well and keep safe. Right. We have our competitive speaker number three, Mr. Karani, um, and he is from the Kenyan Institute for Supply Chain Management. He's the chairman of this institute, uh, which is the professional body for procurement and supply chain, and he is mandated to regulate and address welfare issues of the procurement and supply chain professionals across Kenya. He's also a seasoned Pan-African procurement and supply chain professional with over 27 years of experience in major blue chip multinationals in Africa. Uh, 18 of these years were spent with Coca-Cola Africa. He has a proven success record in complex global and multi-geographical locations. And Mr. Karani is going to address us on uh, this COVID-19 topic, but with a Kenyan perspective. Again, a very important that we get this African, we are an African Institute, and to get this larger African perspective. Mr. Karani, welcome. We're looking forward to your presentation from the Kenyan perspective. Again, supply chain in its essence. You have 20 minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you very much, Program Director, and all um, uh, protocol observed. But I must uh, take the opportunity to also appreciate Professor Ambe, who is the connection between me and ISCA. And I um, really appreciate also all the academic luminaries that have been in here, which has made me be rethink about going back to school. I need to get this professor title <laughs> on before my title. And I, so without much ado, let me also appreciate Professor Douglas Boateng, who is my one of the guys I really admire in this profession. I hope you can all see my screen. Is it showing up? Can all you good. see my screen? All good. All good. Okay. 
You can just go to slideshow if you want to. I can go to slideshow. Let's see. All right. Is it? Let me do that. OK, thank you so much. One more time. Let me quickly just take us through a brief presentation. As a, not many slides, but it's been maybe many slides. So I've been introduced already. I have the privilege of heading a 20,000 member body of professionals coming from both private and public sector, with the public sector being the majority of our members, uh, all, all tasked with regulating this. So it's a government body as a regulator, uh, members and regulatory body uh, tasked with the work of uh, you know, protecting and uh, regulating the profession. So very briefly, I think most of the cases, and I've heard it from the beginning, have a common trend uh, in terms of how we all reacted to COVID. And I'll just take us briefly through uh, the Kenyan case. So for us in Kenya, I really believe, and across the rest of the sector in Africa and globally, there was really, literally, the, the word that became common was unprecedented disruptions for both organizations, for both families, societal level, organizational level, governmental level and totally changed a lot of things. And I think um, Professor Ambe gave a good introduction right at the beginning when he gave a, a global view of the changes that happened uh, economically uh, across the board and across many countries. So I'll not repeat that. But more importantly, it brought to the fore the necessity for companies to assess how well prepared they are to manage crisis and uh, what they do to ensure business continuity. And I know many businesses, especially in the hospitality industry, have been hardest hit with the result of some, some of them closing. You know, forced entire companies, entire industries to rethink or transform, you know, their global supply chains. Uh, otherwise, they will have gone out of business like many did indeed. Exposed the vulnerabilities in many organizations. And this issue that we've talked about for the longest time, the high dependence on China, we're all being forced to rethink that. Professionals, on the other hand, and I think this is a, the SCME, a supply chain professionals, who have been more or less back office people, have been thrust to the front line, you know, by, by force. And so we've been forced to literally be, adapt and adopt, as uh, Professor Mayer keeps saying, and be versatile and agile in order to respond to the changing environment that we're operating in. So all in a nutshell, aimed at saying, how are we going to continue this uh, situation? Uh, Professor Ambe gave a global view earlier on, but this is a Kenyan case, 41,000 cases, uh, probably not as bad as South Africa, and 760 deaths. So death is death, whether it's one person or two people, it's still a tragic situation. So you can see the curve, right? And the peak of it was really in July this year, at 1,932 infections daily. Uh, that's now a bit come down, but still not, we're not out of the woods yet, as we say. So we still have to be careful. We still have to take all the precautionary measures that we've been told. Uh, I want to, the Kenyan case cannot be completed without talking about KEMSA. KEMSA is a Kenya Medical Supplies Authority. And I think from what I've heard from across the board, this is where all things went wrong. This is where uh, the challenges and the, 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 as, as Professor Makanya said, the, the profiteers took advantage of this situation in terms of uh, the medical supplies and uh, basically taking advantage of a very tragic situation to get rich quickly. But this is Kenya Medical Supplies Authority is a central repository in Kenya, the central body that is charged with centrally ordering. Uh, let me uh, it's not a very clear slide, but it's basically the central body where all um, medical requirements are ordered centrally and then redistributed into the various counties and the various using agencies. So it's a very brilliant model, very good model in the sense of, you know, when you think about what we do in supply chain, it's consolidation, it's about leveraging scale, it's about uh, literally putting our orders together. So in that sense, it's a brilliant idea and it has worked very well all the years that it's been in existence until this time of COVID when it became the real vehicle for all the corrupt practices to happen. 
everybody from wherever, you know, whether it's been. So the investigations are not even over yet as we speak. And, and I know, sadly enough, this is replicated across many countries in Africa where high ranking officials took advantage of this um, this particular aspect of, 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 of uh, this tragedy to really take things out of context. And they used KEMSA, which was a vehicle that's already established. And, and even orders that came free of charge from, say, Jack Ma Foundation, uh, never found their way to the common man. You know, they all disappeared. Uh, so, so it basically tells you that much as we had a good body that was tasked with the task of ordering centrally, getting the best price, we ended up literally paying higher prices for for masks, for PPE protection. Availability was a big issue because these things never end, ended up where they were meant to be. Massive funds were really mis, mis, misappropriated. And for a small economy like Kenya, $2 billion is a lot of money that we don't even know where it went, cannot be accounted for, uh, all because of corruption practices. This story I know can be replicated across Africa, but it basically tells us the tragedy of uh, the previous speaker saying, you can have all the regulations, you can have all the laws, but people are the main determining factor. So just giving the other issue that came to the front line during this period, and I think the previous speaker alluded to this, is how do we handle emergency procurement? Uh, we realized that here in Kenya, we did not really have a proper, much as we've got good public laws, we didn't have exactly how do we handle uh, emergency procurement. And that became a vehicle, uh, an excuse for many people to cut shortcuts and do the wrong things. Uh, so we have a provision for direct procurement, which is spelled out in our Public Procurement Act, which is really around war, how do you handle war situations, invasion, uh, disorder, which was which COVID really was close to, but we didn't have a procedure specifically. So we have the provision, but the procedure was not spelled out. So a section of the law permits for retrospective approval of procurement, which you all know can be very dangerous. And that's really what happened, that there was some approval that was done awaiting awaiting uh, approval, I mean, uh, approval for quick, immediate uh, purchases awaiting later on to be approved. And that is where the loophole really came. Uh, so we did provide, as, as the Kenya Institute of Supplies, a regulatory body, we provided a proposal, which we called uh, competitive dialogue, aimed at really how can we apply, how can we make proper rules that help us to circumvent, not really circumvent, uh, go to the market in, a, in an urgent manner and still get value for money for our for the for, for the government and for the institutions that are buying and so that's really what we did uh, propose that to the national assembly and to the senate uh, unfortunately we didn't get approval because i think they do not want that type of thing they still because many people that were involved in this corrupt practices were really politicians the senate and the parliamentarians and so it tells you a lot of things that could have been m mitigated but could not be because of lack of political goodwill and i think that's something that we all need to become very alive to and see how to address so in a nutshell uh, what were the lessons we learned throughout this process um, for us here across and i believe across africa and the world in general there's need to have flexible supply chains which can help us minimize the risk caused by disruption in terms of stress there's, of course, greater need to invest in supply chain resilience, uh, which we have seen can deliver you know, 15 to 25 percent improvement in output and customer satisfaction. There's absolute need to invest in advanced analytics, which we have been told earlier on uh, in the introductory speeches. And many more than anything else, especially us in Africa, uh, you know, the gain shares wanted, uh, wanted, expected the worst things to happen, but it has exposed unfortunate and unprecedented public health crisis and then vulnerable exposed us to those attacks. So another key lesson for us, and we have found this very clear, manufacturers in many industries have scrambled to find uh, alternative supplies to keep factories running. And many companies, you know, here locally have resorted to uh, PPEs, local manufacturing and, uh, you know, sanitizers, all those things are now being made locally. So from almost being a net importer of many of these things, we now have enough local supply base. And I think it tells us that in every crisis, well, there is indeed an opportunity um, 
Some take the opportunity to do the right thing, others take the opportunity to do the wrong thing. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's the reality of human beings. Uh, so uh, it also exposed serious vulnerability in our supply chains, as we've seen. Uh, where, where we need to go now, you know, where we had limited flexibility in a low risk environment. Now we have a highly, uh, the tomorrow that we are going into that we already are in, or the new normal as we call it, highly, we need highly, highly the resilient supply chains to help us to navigate. So there's also the opportunity that we've seen in Kenya, the need for competitive advantage, you know, people, companies, started investing in new products. I didn't understand that. Re, new product re, re, resilience or uh, sh short term, you know, turn around. So how do we change the product cycle so that we uh, we develop products quickly? Means that we don't have the long term, you know, gestation period to create a product from initiation to the actual production. We have to adjust faster to market demand. And people have taken advantage of that. And there are many, and that's the essence of um, capitalistic society, so to speak. We got people really becoming very innovative, rethinking their supply chain, shifting the paradigm shift, and continually innovating to become more relevant in the situation. So what does the future look like? Uh, clearly for us, agility disruption is a new normal for us in supply chain. We need to become agile. Professionals who need to spend less time behind the desk and out there with the stakeholders, internal and external. We need to continually challenge the standard, the industry norms, and define the breakthrough products. And then, more importantly, we need to keep relooking at our specifications. We cannot be, you know, cannot be too choosy this time. We need to constantly innovate and see how we can create products that are. Uh, I cannot overemphasize this aspect of resilience, developing multi sources, manufacturing locally. You know, creating you know buffers. And I pick this out of Gartner. So it's something that applies to all of us. And near shoring is another thing that we have to think about. And of course, uh, uh, specification harmonization and standardization is a big issue that we have to keep on. Some concluding thoughts uh, from me, um, since we talk about research, what can we talk about for again for the Kenya situation? And I think Africa in general, we must learn vital lessons from this pandemic and so that we can be better prepared so that we take advantage as somebody said about Michael Jordan, in every disaster, there must be an opportunity. In every bad situation, how can we make the best of it? And they're much stronger, especially here in Africa, where we have been uh, for the longest time disintegrated in many ways. So how can we improve network agility? How can we invest in digital collaboration? How can we ensure that we have real-time network visibility so that across the chain, end-to-end, we can see how do we do it because because there are so many parts of this supply chain that we deal in that are now been been highly uh, been, been kind of dis disenfranchised. How do we continually have a visibility from end to end source to production to the distribution side of the equation? How do we rap develop rapid solutions for our situation that we're going into? So despite uh, the existential threats that COVID-19 did bring to us, it's really not all gloom and doom. I've said this before, there is a silver lining. There are some key learnings that we can all learn from and we can, and I think we are doing it very quickly, especially for us in Africa. It, it should be a wake up call for Africa to say, how can we look at this as an opportunity to create local solutions, not just within in country, but within our, our Pan-African situation, because for the longest time, we all know that we have been over dependent on importation. Uh, more for us in this part of Africa, maybe less for South Africa, which I know has a strong local industry. But the rest of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, have been almost largely dependent on importation. Yet we've got massive resources that God has blessed us with. Now we've got this new um, you know, Africa trade, free trade area that's been opened up. How can we leverage that and become more interdependent across Africa and reduce the over dependency on Europe, on China, and especially, and strike a healthy balance between you know self sufficiency within country and inter African trade? And that's you know I've, I've never forgotten the idea of being able to wanting to go to Casablanca 
but having to fly to Amsterdam or fly to London because there's no direct flight from Nairobi to, to, to Casablanca. Yet we're in Africa. We have to go to Europe to come back to Africa. That's, a, that's just a, a snapshot of the tragedy of how we've been so disenfranchised as Africa. And so I think it's a time, it's a wake-up call for us to take advantage of this, to open up our economies, to be create more in our close connectivity across Africa. And this team, ISCA, should be the brain, the, 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 the lead to take us towards that. So reduction of imported intermediate goods, again, requires us to redirect our resources so that the country is never left in this vulnerable situation again. We need food, we need medical things, we need fertilizers. How can we create local solutions for that? I keep talking about the recalibration of Pan-African trade interdependence. This to me is the biggest initiative that we as researchers, as academicians, as practitioners can give back to our continent. How can we create this platform that we are able to cut across Africa with solutions that are Pan-African in nature? Ramp up local capacity while, you know, it goes back to what, we, what, I, what I call the economics of comparative advantage. If South Africa is good at certain area, vehicle manufacturing, for instance, we don't need to replicate that. Can that be an area where South Africa can supply the rest of Africa and we capitalize on other goods and eventually become self-sufficient within Africa? It's time for Africa. So it's a wake-up call for us in Kenya, for us in Africa, really, I believe, to retool our manufacturing capabilities, focus on value addition of products instead of exporting our low-value raw materials which only come back to us at highly exorbitant prices after they've been processed, yet we can get the processing capability ourselves here in Africa. So to me, this is a real wake up call, an opportunity for us to rethink our supply chain, to rethink our dependency, to rethink our need for one another in Africa. And uh, this is the age of disruptive technology. We've talked a lot about this. Adaptation is a key word here, digital focus, sustainability, recovery, uh, ripple effects across the chain, and more importantly, how can we be better prepared? So with that, uh, without much ado, I know it's been a bit fast. I know we're trying to catch up on time. I cannot stop, but I cannot stop without insisting that it is time for Africa. It's time for us to partner across the globe. It's time for us to partner across our countries and see, you know, and it starts at this this research perspective, see how can we work together. So with that, I would like to say thank you. And uh, that's my last slide, uh, Program Director. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garoni. Mr. Garoni. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate that. that. Just mute your mic, please. There we go. Um, a very insightful presentation. Um, the aspect of resilience can't be overemphasized. We realize that is something that in Africa we do have an abundance. Sustainability and standardization as important in this whole endeavor. And this is what COVID had taught us for the supply chain. The challenge on the table for our uh, institute placed there. We appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time. The Kenyan perspective. Um, on the COVID take, we appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to push ahead at this uh, time and we're going to ask our fourth competitive speaker, Professor Boteng, who is the chairman of the Ghana Public Procurement Authority and the CEO of Pan Avest International and Partners, um, to enlighten us into uh, the Kenyan perspective of the said uh, pandemic. Now, Professor Boateng is Africa's first ever appointed Professor Extraordinaire for Industrialization and Supply and Value Chain Management at the SBL um, and is International Professional Certified Chartered Director and an adjunct academic. He is also the non-executive chairman of Ghana's Public Procurement Authority. He has received independent recognition and numerous lifetime awards for his extraordinary contribution to the academic and industrial advancement of supply chain management. Professor Boateng, welcome. We appreciate the time that you've taken to enlighten us with a Kenyan perspective on the COVID practices of supply chain. Your 20 minutes starts now. Uh, 
Could we just ask uh, Mr. Karani to stop share on his screen? And there we go. Have I stopped? Is it still on? Or is yes, it off? no, no, it's off. It's fine. Thank you very much. Now we can just get uh, Professor Boteng to share his screen. Thing is muted. Yeah, it seems like it. Professor Boteng. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear? Ah, there, there we go. There we go. You've yeah. just come you live. Uh, no, no, there's no, no. Can't see the slides. Can't see the slides. Okay. Oh, can someone help, help me with the technology here, please? The slides, I can see it on my side. Production team, please assist Professor Boteng. Okay. Um, There's nobody there to show. I'm getting them there. Production team, um, can we kindly assist Prof? I've sent them a WhatsApp as well so they can get going there. Let's just. Uh, um, Q and A is there. Okay, is uh, does the uh, uh, show a key, uh, Professor Boateng, which is open share tray on your screen? No. Okay, can I share on on my side, and then you will tell me to go to the next slide. I think that can work, Winnie, if you don't mind. Um, is Professor there anyone from the production team that can cue the presentation from my side? You let me know if it's visible. Still not visible. We had it. Okay, it's, it's, it's dropped. There it is. There it is. Is it live? Um, it's live. Okay. Then uh, I think Prof can start. Yes, it's live. Okay. I can see it from Prof the side. Boteng, you can, yeah, you can okay. start. Thank you. I have to click from here or I have to do it from my side? To... Uh, no, you can indicate when it must change and then it will, uh, then the production team will change it for you. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, good morning and all protocols observed. It is indeed an honor to be part of this um, very insightful um, gathering of you know leading experts on supply chain. From my side, I'm just going to share with you the experiences obviously in Ghana and um, the lessons that we've learned and how we managed to obviously um, avoid this cataclysmic pandemic which has really shaken the world and obviously got a lot of African leaders to think about uh, you know, reconfiguring their supply chains to meet the needs of the people. I am, I am a victim of the pandemic. I have been stuck in Ghana for the last eight months or so. I'm, <laughs> I live in South Africa, but the day I was supposed to leave, the airport shut down. And it's been quite an experience for me in terms of, you know, the strength of Ghanaians and you know Africa for that matter how we've managed to really move forward and avoid this uh, you know the unintended consequences of the pandemic. Now from uh, from Ghana perspective what were the things that we learned? Um, move on to the next slide for presentation objective please. 
um, accountability from Ghana perspective became the key to managing the, the pandemic. Initially, there was a lot of panic. Um, next slide, please. There was a lot of panic in terms of what this, you know, COVID-19 was all about. You know, for me, the shock was the, the, the confusion with the messaging that was going around. It was very, very technical. Um, there was a lot of information being passed around, which no, didn't make sense to the ordinary Ghanaian, which resulted in a lot of stigma and doubts. There was a fear of, um, you know, death associated with um, um, COVID-19, you know, and one of the things which became so apparent to us was the confusion between SARS-CoV-2 and uh, COVID-19. You may carry SARS-CoV-2, but you might not necessarily get COVID-19, the disease. It's, you know, it's like HIV and AIDS, you know, and um, the messaging coming out basically from the beginning was, you know, was the wrong focus, which resulted in a lot of panic buying you know, hand sanitizers, water, bottled water, face masks, food, drinks, etc. And what puzzled me was, you know, toilet rolls. Why were people buying so much, many toilet rolls? Was it because COVID-19 was causing diarrhea? It, it didn't make sense to, you know, people like me in Ghana. Then I realized that they were buying it for to use as a tissue, but the markets were run out of toilet rolls, which was very, very interesting for, um, you know, the associated supply chain because they did not understand whether it was a sudden surge in diarrhea or people were just using it for tissues. Next slide. What was the impact? A lot of uh, companies basically shut down. It was a virtual shutdown all of a sudden within 24, 48 hours, except for the fact that obviously Things like utilities, you know, water and electricity, the, the, the demand went up. But hospital, um, hospitality and tourism, disaster, restaurants, um, drinks and water went up. Retail sector it was a downward trend. Nutraceuticals obviously went up because of messages from the, from the, the president and the COVID-19 team. Aviation sector virtually shut down. Clothing and textiles were struggling. Um, sports, obviously, you know what was happening. And the most interesting part was also churches. Church, for me, in Africa, is a big business. They were also suffering because, obviously, nobody was allowed to go to church. Construction sector, also major problems. Funeral services. The funeral supply chain in Africa and in Ghana, in particular, is a big money-generating sector, funerals. The catering of funeral services, the coffins, the, 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 the cars that transport the body, you know, the, the, the people that are associated with all the funeral services, all shut down. Loss of income, company closures, you know, which are implications also for families um, relying on these sectors. Financial services also suffered. The chemical sector, obviously sanitizers went up. Um, and then utilities, as I mentioned, offices, disaster for office owners. Next slide, please. Now, along this panic, obviously the president took charge and basically decided to update uh, the public virtually on a weekly basis. And the idea behind it was to, you know, basically um, try and calm the fears of the people because virtually everybody was stuck in house. Um, including myself, nobody was going out, you know, and through the team started to obviously put out simple messages about um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus and the disease, trying to educate the public on, um, you know, the differences that, you know, and emphasizing that if you have um, SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't necessarily mean you are going to get, get the full-blown COVID-19. And even if you get a COVID-19, it doesn't mean that you are going to die, you know. And that regular messaging really helped to allay the fears of people. And um, also they coined what is called the living with the virus strategy, that the virus is here to stay and we need to find a way of adapting to coexist with the virus. And what for me was interesting was the fact that once the leader of the country started to talk about the issues associated with it, you know, the fear 
was minimized. And then they started to use uh, social media and um, a lot of various intermediaries to really help to allay the fears of the people. Because at the end of the day, if the people understand the implications, it makes it easier for, to coexist with the virus. And the citizens also took responsibility, you know, for reducing the infection cases, which was also positive. There was a lot of information from the WHO and from the leading countries like Australia, um, Taiwan and so forth. But the president and his COVID team adapted rather than adopt what was coming out from these um, countries. They looked at the Ghana situation and came up with a strategy that will work for Ghanaians, which has been very, very successful. They also involved the sector leaders, you know, from the hospitality, from the funeral services industry, even the churches, um, the, the financial services, all regularly met to discuss issues to do with their supply chains. For me, supply chain exists in every sector, be it financial services to hospitality to government. They are all supply chains. And the, the president and his team brought all these people together regularly to talk about issues and how to avoid some of the, the consequences of the pandemic, which has been very, very successful. And there was regular updates on radio, TV, um, social media platforms in terms of how to stay safe and avoid um, um, the, the, the virus, plus also protect your fellow citizen. You know, the problem was huge, but how we dealt with it as a nation led by the president was uh, rather interesting, you know, and it has worked really well for the various supply chains in Ghana. Not that industries have not been affected, it has been affected really badly, but there's still confidence that we will be able to bounce back uh, as a nation and also as sectors. Next slide. Now, part of the contribution from myself was uh, I came up with what is called the Corona, corona Meter Update, where some of it was also sent to South Africa. Um, for, for them to adapt through UNISA. And every week to this day, it's still going, it's very, very popular. Thousands of people get it every week just to show what we are doing and how we compare to um, other African countries and our benchmark Ghana against especially South Africa and also to the global community. And so far, we, we seem to be doing extremely well. Very simplified data, which obviously I, I, I share via WhatsApp platform and various social media platforms to, to, to benchmark ourselves in terms of where we are. Next slide. Now, what has been the result? We've managed to contain the, 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 the virus, at least within Ghana. Um, the, the confidence level is definitely back. Yes, a lot of job losses, company closures, but the confidence level is certainly back. There's more optimism within various supply chains that it will definitely be bouncing back. And there's a lot of activity on the ground right now to, to that effect. New subsectors have also emerged out of the unfortunate um, pandemic. The face mask industry is one of them. Um, sanitizers, nutraceuticals definitely. Phytoceuticals is definitely up. And Ghana right now is being positioned because of a lot of um, the air cargo and passes that were coming through could it's now being positioned as a an aviation sub hub for at least the Okoba sub region um sectors that are slowly bouncing back uh, even include the tourism because i see a lot of our neighbors are beginning to fly into to ghana when the airports opened you know to spend some time here um there's definitely um, citizenry carefulness and compliance in terms of basically wearing the face masks um, they try and do the social distancing and um, the hand washing and personal hygiene has definitely improved because um, every shop that you go into, you see the, the, the hand washers there and you see people. I go to the shops and also to various marketplaces. People are observing the max. Um, it's a bit humid here. There's a little bit of complacency, but as soon as the president and his COVID team come out to talk about the issue of wearing the mask, people still go back. Uh, the fatigue has set in, but it's still being managed. But definitely in terms of industrial supply chains, um, a lot of sectors are beginning to bounce back. Um, and it's very good for the, the, the society. 
Next slide. Now, my experience, what made this thing so far work? Effective leadership within various supply chains and even from um, the government is key to, to ensuring that when there's crisis, you are able to contain it. The president and his team, supported by society, obviously took charge and they had a strategic plan in terms of basically uh, containing the virus. They kept the whole model very simple, not complex, you know, which did work. When you keep things simple within a supply chain, it makes it easier to obviously implement, and this is what happened in Ghana. There was a common communication standards among the various players within um, the various supply chains and also with governments. The government also applied rule of law, which was very, very important, that if you don't wear your marks, you'll be arrested. And obviously, it, 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 it did make a difference. You know, it was participatory. Very, very important. Every single Ghanaian was involved as a citizen, and it did work. And, you know, they also looked at the, the opportunities that was coming out of it. You know, so they were thinking long term, and there was a lot of monitoring and evaluation. Transparency and openness between government and society was there. So it made it very, very easy for people to really accept the message and, and, and move on. Because at the end of the day, it's a behavior thing that we were managing to minimize the impact on uh, supply chains. And the timeliness of the communication between supply chain partners was also critical. And there was collaboration, genuine collaboration between the, the various stakeholders within Ghana. Next slide, please. Lessons learned again, you know, obviously accountable leadership. The government and the president took charge. And then the, the society obviously uh, followed through. Um, it was process driven, simplified, and people were held responsible within the various supply chains for their actions. Um, it really did push the boundaries in terms of people becoming very socially responsible responsible. There was a lot of donations from the private sector, which was very, very interesting for me. Their support to really make this thing, you know, work, which was very, very interesting. And the process followed by the government was more customer driven. They saw the citizens as customers and made sure that what they were <laughs> producing, the information we just saw as a product was fit for purpose. By fit for purpose, I mean that the information was easily digestible by the people. Sometimes we do ignore that in supply chains. People think supply chains is about just product, the tangible product. Information from government, you know, is a product. And now the government is slowly learning that they need to obviously look at the information that they use for planning purposes, which is a product, which is for me positive. Some of the things that have come out. It was very focused and a forced decision and policy makers to also learn about each other and also break functional silos. As of today, as of uh, October 5th, uh, rather, this was the picture. You had globally about 35 million people that had been infected. The recovery rate was 74.4%. Active cases was 22.62. Uh, South Africa had 681,000. Um, infection cases. Recovery rate was 90.2%. Active case was 7.27. And, and death rate, unfortunate death rate was 2.49. In Ghana, we have, um, as of October 5th, 46,000 infection cases. And the recovery rate is remarkably at 98.4%. And our active cases today is 1%. Death rate has never gone beyond 1%. And it's because the citizens we really took charge of this <coughs> unfortunate situation and basically decided to make sure that it doesn't overrun us. And it, so far it's working. I'm sure you all heard the, 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 the quote by the, the, the president, we know how to rebuild the economy, but not how to bring the dead back to life. This is how Ghana, we decided to manage it. Let's focus on protecting lives. The economy, we can make it work again. And surely Ghana slowly is beginning to bounce back. Next slide. In conclusion, 
it's been a, an interesting journey for the citizens of Ghana, but it has also opened a lot of opportunities for the forward thinking people. And it's also shown that within supply chain management, when there's a crisis and the functional silos and entities work together, it is possible. Um, during crisis, for me, we must, as Africans, first see the opportunity and then obviously look at the problems that are associated with the opportunity. It has been a very interesting um, experience for me and opened a lot of eyes in terms of what can be done with the Africa Free Trade Continental Area. It came at opportune time and it's really educated Ghanaians that there could be opportunities for Africa to reconfigure its supply chains and basically create jobs for the people of the continent. In terms of the Made in Africa agenda, it is back alive because Africans now know that they can do it. Um, in terms of visibility within supply chains and the impact for procurement pro professionals, procurement is back on the agenda because right now a lot of things are to be pro procured. Yes, there's been a lot of unfortunate corruption but then it is also helped to put the focus back on the role of the procurement profession in terms of really helping to, to, to uh, manage, um, you know, supply chains. So this wake up call, there has been positives. Yes, there's been a lot of negatives, but the positives would really help Ghana and the rest of Africa move forward. I have concluded that the best of Africa is ahead of us. Thanks to this unfortunate pandemic, we are going to definitely develop the supply chains on the continent. Procurement is back on the agenda. We just have to professionalize and basically make sure that whatever we buy, there is value for money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Baojeng. Um, as always, I heard you speak before, very enlightening, very interesting perspective. Um, we appreciate the Ghanaian point of view as this important, um, as this is an important aspect of the whole of Africa as well. Uh, the fact that we're not going to lie down, that we're going to take this on the cheek, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. The endeavors that you're involved with, we appreciate this tremendously. Uh, best of luck with everything. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us uh, to the end of the first session. Um, there will be a short lunch break now of approximately 30 minutes. Uh, thereafter, my co-host and co-program director will become the program director, uh, Mrs. Winnie Lamini. Um, uh, Winnie, if you on the air, would you please be so kind as to introduce yourself before we go on the break? I think Winnie is looking for unmute. There we go, Winnie. I have got it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Prof Mayor, you've been amazing in your job as a program director this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to be taking you through the afternoon session. So for now, we will take a short break and I will introduce myself further when we come back from the break. Um, please just be on time so that we can finish early. Thank you. Okay, so Thank you, Winnie. That means uh, uh, twelve thirty exactly. Yes, yes, Prof. That is okay. correct. 100%. Thank you very much. All back at twelve thirty. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For our second session, can you please move to link two? We will be ending this session. This, will, this was our first session for our second session. Can you please log on to link two? Thank you very much.